Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. All right, welcome to another episode of Plain Spoken, where we delve into the minds shaping the future of business and leadership. Today, you know, this is actually a lot of fun because once again, I've got someone who I consider a friend as well as a colleague. And I've got Trevor Hunter, a distinguished executive coach and a pioneer in integrating scientific insights into leadership development. Trevor's not just any coach. He's a strategist who believes in unlocking human potential through evidence-based methodologies of talentism, where he has transformed numerous organizations by applying principles from neuroscience, psychology, and evolutionary biology. Trevor and Talentism's unique approach does not adjust behaviors, but aligns them with organizational goals, ensuring that leadership is not only about vision, but also about actionable and measurable outcomes. His work has been pivotal in helping leaders navigate through IPOs, mergers, rapid scaling, and that's made him and the Talentism team a sought-after group of, sought after group of experts for companies facing complex challenges. And I can say that that was absolutely the case with me as Trevor was my executive coach. So today I'm hoping he's going to share some of Talentism's methodologies and how they can help leaders achieve clarity, align their teams, and drive exceptional business results in uncertain times, which all times really are if we really look at them. So Trevor, welcome to Plain Spoken. And I will stop reading from my really crappy teleprompter (laughs) and remind people that as someone who has coached people in sports and loves coaching and all this sort of stuff, I was probably one of the most resistant business coaching clients in the universe uh, and until I actually found you guys. And then I had a, what I would consider a three plus year relationship that continues to this day and I am better for it. So welcome and thanks for taking the time to be with us today, Trevor. Well, thank you so much, Derek, for having me. And and I will say, I do remember you being fairly resistant, but it's a pretty consistent pattern in my experience that uh, the best clients are the ones who come in authentically skeptic. Uh, and not doubtful, not like this is going to work. Why would I do this? But like, I don't know, I'm open. This has worked, but you know, prove it to me. Then, then I feel like that's uh, that's the playing ground where I feel the most uh, at ease. I uh, before I let you tell us more about yourself, you know, that goes well beyond the surface level introduction that I was able to cobble together for this podcast. Since you know, while I spent years doing sports podcasts, actual business podcasts are still relatively new to me. Uh, I I want to point out or ask. You know, the lunacy of rejection of coaching, uh, looking back on it now, is painful. Do others who were like me have that same epiphany moment? Like, I remember learning any sport that I ever played, and I went to coaches to get better. When I look at the great athletes across the world, all of them have coaches. It doesn't matter how great they are. They all have someone who they listen to who tells them when they suck or when they could get better. And we could we could couch that as an optimistic spin. I don't care, right? Yeah. Do, do, does the light come on for other people? Because it sure as hell came on for me um, when I was with you guys. Well, if I do my job well, then I think it does, uh, which, you know, <laughs> sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, for as glib as I was just sounding, the I think it makes sense to be skeptical when you are uh, coming to a new relationship and saying, hey, I'm going to, if not place my trust now, learn to place my trust in you to tell me when uh, when I'm doing good or doing bad, which can be a very challenging thing for any human being to hear. And so if somebody's, you know, if somebody's coming into the relationship, it's like, oh yeah, please uh, tell me all the ways I'm wrong. Uh, my experience is actually pretty often that that uh, doesn't, uh, work super well in a coaching relationship. That is, there's there's uh, too much of a, a desire to like free yourself from fear and get it right and and like 
become a perfect human being and all that. And that's just not how I think about coaching. It's not how I think about human beings or anything. And so, yeah, I think uh, in the best coaching relationships, there will be that gradual movement from, hey, prove it to me. I'm open to this, but let's see what you got to, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's like any other relationship. You build that through uh, actually being together, actually making sense of confusing things together and uh, and learning uh, to trust each other. Well, before we delve into confusion and clarity, which I know is a hot button for you and the folks at Talentism for good reason, uh, I, I want you to give folks a little bit of background on who you are, how, how you relate to Talentism, because you're you're a foundational member there on, on the team. Uh, and But just in your own words, like uh, it's one of those things when you go to a coach, I went through, I think, 12 different coaching teams before I, I finalized on Talentism. Now, that doesn't mean that Talentism is perfect for everyone. I think it's very much like any relationship, as you've yeah. alluded to. Um, but tell people a little bit about where you come from, why you give a damn about this, and and a little bit more about talentism. Yeah, so I was reflecting, I knew a question like this was likely to be asked, and I was reflecting on this. I've been coaching now for seven years, I think, and the first coaching session for everyone is always a life interview. Um, and I've never had a life interview. Nobody's ever given me a life interview, so uh, I am unpracticed at this particular narrative. But if I'm reflecting on um, how I got here, I think there's there's two important people to talk about. Um, the first is um, uh, my father. Now, my father had two things about him. The first, which was that he was uh, born on the long, wrong side of the uh, tracks uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He lived in a two-bedroom apartment with uh, five children. He, we always had stories about, you know, getting socks and underwear for Christmas, and that was the best you could hope for, and the absolutely atrocious food that he ate and continued to like uh, throughout his life. Um, and uh, in the value of of you know of hard work of sticking out and all that but at the same time somebody who truly and deeply felt he was a deeply lucky person uh because uh he was born in cambridge he was able to uh leverage a swim scholarship into harvard he was able to um have the luck and the privilege of being a uh a guy in the right place at the right time and he knew how lucky he was and he spent his life talking about um how important it was to create those conditions for other people um in his own work and with others and so i grew up in in a household where things like uh don't let perfect be the enemy of the good uh don't turn down a, a open door um, before you peek into it, uh, talking about the idea of potential was just part of growing up. Now, to be clear, I hated business growing up. I, I hated it uh, through my 20s. I was a, a musician who was frequently confused about uh, going to the dinner table and hearing all my uh, my dad and my brothers talk about uh, the latest business thing they had to deal with. I have this memory of my brother, my middle brother going away to Harvard Business School and coming back. Now I'm convinced that this is the false memory, but it's I think it's indicative, indicative of how it like transplanted into my mind of him coming back from Harvard Business School and saying, oh, I was in this really interesting uh, class where, um, you know, the professor said, hey, if this old lady uh, asked you to manage her money and she and you realize she didn't understand how much money she had, would it be ethical to steal from her? And and again, fairly convinced this is a false memory, but in my mind, it's like, that was what business was, <laughs> trying to justify <laughs> stealing from old women. <laughs> wow, you went right to the intent of the question. Not even You didn't even bother with the question. You went right to what was the question or the intent behind it. <laughs> And so, so I didn't, I just had no interest in that at all. Um, 
but the sort of language of human potential, the idea of uh, how do you be your best self and whatever it is that you're doing in life, how do you help others uh, who aren't as privileged as you are? That was very much in the, the soup of my upbringing. Um, but to more directly answer your question, the second person that I would say was uh, uh, really uh, helped lead me on this path is my uh, oldest brother, who's the CEO of Talentism. I am, right. I'm, I'm a Nepo baby. Um, ah! <laughs> uh, he, uh, I have been around, I'm the oldest serving employee at this point, but what I came on as was uh, somebody working 20 hours uh, or $20 an hour to write some articles. Um, I had just uh, finished a biochemistry degree. Uh, I had previously been a music journalist. I had a weird... Well, those two go together like peanut butter oh, and jelly, yeah. right? Musicians yeah, yeah. and biochemistry. Yeah, no, I did. I did the standard uh, music to biochemistry to CEO coaching. Heard it a million times. I know. Um, so I won't bore you with those details, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, when he brought me into talentism, um, at the uh, very, very close to the outset, he, as he had been for a lot of my life, just had this, um, unwavering, uh, belief in my own potential, um, as somebody who was uh, confused about what he was doing and how to apply my own talents to the world. And what he gave me was a context to experiment in and the guidance to make sense of those experiments. And he's continued to do that for the nine years I've been there. Um, and so the way he describes it, I think is probably appropriate is he brought me in to write some articles about what is the what's the validity of the science behind the things he was saying at the time about the nature of business and people in business and so i wrote those articles and i was like yeah they're, they're more or less directionally correct and eh, maybe this thing isn't all the way right but yeah i think this is this is good enough um and over time i started to connect with it more and more not only through what i'd experienced uh with uh, you know, growing up in the household that I grew up in, but also I, like many people, like when I got out of college, I had a lot of friends who I bright eyed and bushy tail who were excited about going on and to their career who one, two years later were sitting there at a dead end job looking dead eyed, uh, and telling me about, well, you know, my manager says that I'm good at these four things, but this fifth thing I really need to work on. So I'm spending all my time on this thing I hate. Um, and that definitely played into my, at the time, a uh, very negative view of, of business, but it starting to work with talentism connected to me to experiences like that, where it just didn't make sense to me. It just didn't make sense to me how, um, people, companies approached work by and large. And, uh, and so as Jeff, my brother says, it's like, he hired me to uh, write some articles about tennis. And eventually I decided that I wanted to pick up a racket and try playing tennis. And eventually I decided that I wanted my career to be playing tennis. Um, and I think that's roughly correct. Now, uh, at this point, for as much as I did all these different things in terms of uh, music critic, musician, biochemist, whatever, I can't imagine doing anything else at this point. It is every single day, there's a new problem, there's a new person that I want to help, um, and people that I deeply care about that I get to work with. And uh, it took me a while to get there, but I can't imagine a, a better job for me at this point. It's it's amazing. So I've known you, like I said, I, I am terrible with names, dates, and faces. So I think we've known each other for about three and a half, four years, but it could be 10 for all I know, because I, you know, while I'm really good with math, apparently not when it comes to date math. At any rate, I never knew there was a Massachusetts tie. My family is from Massachusetts. Oh, uh, I had never heard the story of your father. Um, not, not that in our coaching sessions, it's a bi-directional, you know, couch time. But I mean, generally speaking, over that period of time, you're going to stumble into some formative stories 
Uh, there were, however, some interesting things I want to pull, and then I want to jump into a couple of other topics, but Harvard times two. So your father was able to parlay a rowing scholarship into Harvard. So wrong side of the Sw tracks. Swimming scholarship. Oh, sorry, swimming. Yeah. Wrong side of the tracks to Harvard. Pretty solid move, right? And then his family, at least one of your siblings, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. goes the Harvard route as, as well, Yeah. Um, which is fascinating um because there's a you know obviously a lot of discussion about higher education the importance thereof these sorts of things there there is no one path towards success or self-actualization but uh but really interesting to see that sprinkled across and i don't know and you and i share podcasts and all sorts of other goofy crap that we find interesting <laughs> i fell into a, a rabbit hole of a gentleman named scott galloway galloway i believe that's his name uh, professor g uh interesting all right, I'm, I'm not I'm not a proponent. I'm not banging the table for him. I'm just saying, if you haven't listened to him, listen to him. And he talks a little bit about, and I used to call this the Lucky Sperm Club, right? Being born in America, male, Caucasian, right? You already have a bunch of advantages. And I don't care if you listen to this podcast and you're an anti-white privilege person or you're, I don't really give a shit where you're entrenched. The reality is those benefits are non-negotiable. They were there and they are still there in varying degrees. That doesn't mean that you don't deserve any accolades for, for doing great stuff. It doesn't mean that you don't have to participate in the recipe. It just means you started out a little bit ahead of the curve, and that's great. Um, mm -hmm. Now, with with all of that, parlaying, and then your, your roundabout way in via the, well, not really roundabout, the traditional route from musician to biochemist to executive coach. Completely um, traditional. Totally traditional. The thing that brought me to talentism was what I felt was a more scientific approach to coaching. Um, and you've already used some of the vernacular, right? So, uh, attacking confusion, trying to drive clarity, providing a context, setting up experiments, like these things resonated with me. Can you discuss with folks here a little bit about what I think is some of talentism's secret sauce for lack of the, a better phrase? What is it that makes you guys special with regards to how you approach the challenges that, uh, executives and business leaders face? Yeah, I think so. On the one hand, I want to say that um, very little that talentism talks about is completely new. Um, so much, I was, you know, if I already referenced my father uh, going through his library, that there are just books about all this stuff going, Peter Drucker going, going way back. Um, Peter Zengi, uh, major influence on his thinking, and then through osmosis ours. Um, these sorts of principles aren't new under the sun. I think the way that we package them is, uh, is unique. And I think the way that we package them is a byproduct of, uh, the people, um, as it so often is, which is talentism was started by my brother, Jeff, who, um, was both a serial entrepreneur and been a multiple time founder CEO and had also worked in um, HR and recruiting at large companies, uh, Dolby, uh, uh, EA, uh, not large company, but a notable one, Bridgewater. Um, he had a wealth of experience uh, to bring to the table, not just sort of theoretical academic thinking, but actual lived in experience with it. Now I didn't have that. I was, you know, uh, the traditional musician to biochemist route doesn't provide um, that same type of experience. Uh, and also I wanna be clear, uh, I studied science too much to um, uh, not have the respect to say, I am not a scientist. Um, I enjoy scientific level thinking. I uh, like Jeff, uh, really enjoy philosophy, love philosophy of science, which leads to real um, nerding out about things like methodology. But I wouldn't consider myself a scientist. I wouldn't consider us as an organization that's doing science in any way. Um, but we're definitely influenced by that level of thinking. I think it was the combination of Jeff's experience with my own um, critical uh, eye towards um, methodology, towards what sort of studies uh, make sense and don't make sense, which have led to where we are right now. I think part of it is, and by the way, I don't say this as a virtue, I say that it's just 
who we are. When you go to a lot of science-backed organization or uh, coaching organizations, any other type of organization, what you'll see a lot of the time is they'll talk about two things, neuroscience, neuroscience and uh, psychology. And I definitely am intrigued by, by neuroscience, but there is a wealth of scientific information out there in other fields, which I think it's highly relevant to human beings at work. And my biggest, my personal biggest influence on that is a professor at Stanford, uh, Robert Sapolsky, who is a neuroscient neuroscientist and a uh, primatologist. So he studied baboons and uh, through his study of baboons created uh, a really popular um, class at Stanford about human behavior that's up on YouTube. When I was younger, I was obsessively watching his, his class uh, on YouTube uh, on human behavior, but he has this way of bucketing of um, going through all the different types of information you can have about why humans behave the way they do, not just neuroscience, not just psychology, but also primatology, evolutionary biology, held down into things like biochemistry, uh, etiology, et cetera, et cetera. And it's that sort of thing really appeals to me. I'm not saying that's the right way, but for me, that sort of um, multidisciplinarianism uh, really does appeal to me. Um, and so bringing in those types of sources as well as things like philosophy, uh, I think, is the sort of origins of what our special sauce really is. It's that experience of Jeff's. It's that multidisciplinary um, approach with the actual science and trying to cast as wide a view as possible about the nature of humans uh, in a complex, in the mathematical sense, business environment. Well, it's interesting. I uh, appreciate all the disclaimers about you're not a scientist and all that, but I think a lot of that's largely unnecessary. I don't think we're going to get uh, audited for the veracity of any of the scientific approach. Uh, the the nice part from uh, my lived experience and being coached by you guys and, and assuming that this is how your other coaches also approach things, though obviously with their own tone, tenor, and, and approach, you you structured the coaching sessions that I went through uh with a backdrop in rough sort of elementary to middle school scientific method, which was experimentation, mm -hmm. right? Let's, let's listen to what you're saying. What is your experience? What are your observations? Uh, do you have a hypothesis? And if there is a hypothesis, how can we test the hypothesis? But where that multidisciplinary approach comes in is you were always able to try and find some way to resonate with the scenario. And so like, Part of the thing, one of the things I was excited about having you on here is, first of all, I, I enjoy our conversations and I, and I miss them because we don't have them as often as we used to. But I look out in the world and I see so many coaches. I mean, it is like everyone and their brother or sister is coaching. And, and I'm not saying that they're not all great at it. Hell, for all I know, they're all fantastic. But I know that what put you above the other 12 that led me to, to leverage you was this approach this he's sort of i always call him blo basic blocking and tackling right mm -hmm. how do we go into anything it was never like you walked in with a miter saw and hoped that i had to you know do crown molding that day right you had a whole toolbox back there and you would listen and figure it out and be able to leverage that now how how has how have you let's stop doing a talentism you're not here for a talentism commercial though i'm, I'm happy to advocate for talentism because <laughs> i'm a huge proponent how have you leveraged that skill set across Folks, other than me, you're welcome to use our experience in so much as you feel it's useful, but you can also broadcast across your others. You know, what are some success stories for this methodology? What are the things that, like, sometimes it's hard to go to work in a day, right? I imagine, yeah. even for you, someone who loves what they do. Sometimes you wake up and you're like, this is bullshit. I don't want to do it. Um, what are the what are the experiences you've had that bring you back? The ones where you're like, ah, damn it, it may be the day where I have another one of those Ian moments or Nancy moments. <laughs> uh, well, um, I don't think you could ask me a more difficult, um, question than what are the ways in which I've been successful? Um, hard on yourself much? Uh, well, uh, Irish Catholic, uh, <laughs> working class father background. <laughs> um, it crept in. Um, yeah, I, 
one of the challenges I have in this is I do kind of feel like I experience them maybe every day is a bit much, but every week. Um, and, uh, and a lot of it actually comes uh, from my work internally at Talentism, which is we're talking about coaching, but uh, in a manner of speaking, I'm effectively a coach for um, the entire executive team at Talentism too. Um, and so the, when I think about what keeps me coming back, what, it, what are the successes? What it's, what is it? There was this thing, I tell this story sometimes. Um, it was a story about uh, a, f a friend who broke me. And it's, um, he was coming to me and it's like, hey, can, I need some advice about, and it was about a, a girl he was just starting dating. And it's like, um, and it was about, he was going to leave for a semester and he was doing all this stuff. And it's like, oh, what should I do here? And it's like, well, whatever you do, don't do X. I won't say what he did, but don't, don't go tell this person this thing. Don't go do this. And then what he do? He did exactly that. He went and told this person and it ended up being a complete disaster and, um, and hurt feelings on all sides. And at that point, uh, it broke me because it's like, nobody, why do I even give advice? Yep. Nobody listens to advice. I don't, I don't give a shit about advice anymore. And so uh, I was 19, I think, when that happened, something like that. Um, and I resolved to myself, I'm never going to give advice again. That, that hasn't actually uh, worked out. But what it taught me is people would still come and talk to me about problems. And I was like, well, I'm not going to tell them what to do. So I'm just going to listen to them. And they would sit there and they would, and they would talk. It's like, well, this and this. And I'd be curious, well, how are you thinking about that? I'd ask them questions like, well, you know, what about this? Have you considered this? What, what's this? How do you think about this particular problem? And what I noticed is that uh, they, they, if you just held up the mirror, if you just pointed out areas in which they were blind or not thinking about it, that they would often come up with better ideas on their own. Like whatever my advice might've been at the start was usually worse than whatever they ended up coming up with if I just kind of helped them think through it better. And, uh, and so throughout my twenties, I would, you know, in social situations, I would just sit there and like, listen to people and talk to them. And that had nothing to do with me wanting to be a coach. That had nothing to do with me practicing a craft. It was just sort of a fascination with humans and a increasing understanding that listening, reflecting and pointing out where things didn't make sense in their logic had a lot more value than just telling them what to do. It was also in line with your obstinate move to never, ever give advice again. So that's useful. Yeah. Uh, you know, my uh, obstinance has been useful on occasion. <laughs> um, and so when I think about, okay, well, where, where are the things that, um, that I'm most proud of? Well, one of the problems with me connecting to it is because I don't, it's, I feel intensely proud of people that I work with. I feel intensely proud of, um, of executives I work with, with, uh, early career people. I, when I see people like recognize something they're missing, recognize, uh, a fear that they have and push through it. Um, that's one of the best feelings in the world to me. The one that sticks out in my mind the most, it wasn't even as part of it, it was coaching related, but it wasn't talentism related, is one of my um, friends uh, was going through a job change. And I was talking with him every couple of weeks and trying to coach him through finding a new job. And he is somebody with deep security triggers, didn't like being out of work. I mean, as most people don't, um, and was really in pain and really working on like identifying what his fear was, how that fear was going to lead him to accept a job, a dead end job that had nothing to do with what he wanted, like, and helping him find the courage in himself 
to uh, to stick it out, keep experimenting, keep trying different things, and ending up landing a job that completely changed his career tra trajectory. On the one hand, I don't feel like I I did anything other than just be with him and uh, in those moments, but I was so so proud of him for for doing that. Um, I was so so proud. I mean, he went from a shoe salesman to a, a product leader uh, in a couple of years. Um, and, uh, and there's just examples like that all the time. There's so many people at Talentism. There's so many people uh, that I work with where you help them see what they're missing. You help them find uh, what they're confused about, what they're scared of, and they find it themselves, the thing to push through to improve upon. If I may use you as an example. Yeah, sure. The, um, when we were uh, working together, the thing that was uh, clearest to me at the beginning was that you were somebody who had been in a lot of different positions as an engineer, as a consultant, who had a lot of opinions about how things should be done and was uh, really struggling with giving people the space uh, to figure it out themselves and learn themselves. Right. And um, and I think I told you this at the time, you are definitely not the first person I've encountered who struggled with that particular <laughs> thing. Good to know. Very, very common thing to struggle with. But to see, to hold up that mirror to say, hey, Derek, here's what I think you're doing, um, to have you work through that, come to a matter of uh, self-acceptance about that, to... Uh, then start to design experiments for you know giving people more space giving them more responsibility letting them fail productively uh towards their own learning then uh in the the correlation is a little bit weak here but then i remember when i attended a offsite with you and your in your team at the time and seeing the and I told you this, it was one of the better leadership demonstrations I've ever seen. The the way you engaged with your team, the way that you gave them space, the way that you supported them, I really did find inspiring and found it really intensely meaningful. Um, and it, it feels bad. This is the Irish Catholic thing. It feels bad for me to say, and I'm like, I'm glad I helped you. I have no idea if I helped you. With that. <laughs> but um, the... But to think through the person that I started working with and what I saw in that room was a very meaningful experience for me. Well, I, you know, I appreciate the the kind words. Uh, and I have never shied away from pointing out the benefits that I got from the coaching, right? I, anyone who will listen, um, you know, you use the phrase blind spots, which is an area we worked on a lot. Uh, when you are pretty sure you're the smartest person in every room, which was the arrogant asshole that you started with, um, and you are forced is the wrong word when you're encouraged to pay more attention to things and to see these blind spots and then to experiment on them to try and figure out what what they came from, what, you know, typically their defense mechanism, in my experience, I can't speak for other people's lived experience, but, you know, the idea of going in and saying, well, I already know the answers. Now you guys are just tools through which I can effectuate my answers. Uh, that's not leadership right that's well it's a form of leadership it's dictatorial and it's not particularly scalable and it's certainly not accretive to to make an organization that's better and build people who are independent and it's only ever going to be as good as the individual's perspective that's driving it so uh learning through the coaching that i did with you and and i was been you know i, I benefited from having amazing people around me, right i mean mm -hmm. i i still to this day as i'm rebooting my career here in my 50s uh, you know, you see on the, I've got the requisite books on the shelf cause you have to have that. So it looks like you're learned. Um, but I've, I've re I'm a recent reader of Simon Sinek. I had been tangentially aware of his shtick. Um, and I don't mean to diminish it. It's great. He's a fantastic speaker, mm -hmm. but, and I said this on a previous podcast for me, it wasn't my why it's my who I know the kind of people I want to work with. And in some cases I know the exact humans who are those people, what we do together is is really just color. It's yeah. it's that I want to work with people that I love, trust, and respect. And you don't get there on day one. You get there through experience, 
Uh, and, and I would never have had that depth of experience with them if I had not learned through the coaching that I took with, with you guys to be open to those things. Uh, that concept of letting someone fail. I always, I, like, I always, I almost have a physical response to that because I was told that years ago at Microsoft, right? Sometimes you have to let a project fail. And I was like, bullshit. If I know a thing that will stop it from failing, it's my job to make it not fail. And then we'll figure it out in the postmortem why we were all too stupid to, to save it earlier. Right. Uh, I, I would couch it a little differently. You've got to let let the threads of that sort of multiverse live out, right? Because mm-hmm. while I might think it's going to fail, my version of fail is a is a subjective assessment of what the outcome will be from my own perspective, right? My perspective is not the only one; is oftentimes not the best one. So I've got to at least encourage and help collaborate. To, to drive that sort of experience. So the blind spot yeah. thing is really, really critical. It, it definitely was a big deal for me in my coaching with you. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, you know, you referenced the the books you have behind you. I somewhat, uh, oh, wait, by the way, yeah, there you go. Re- reverse to my screen. Um, that one right there, it's uh, definitely not a business book. Uh, that's a uh, book called The Ignorant Schoolmaster by Jacques Rancière, uh, mm. who's a French philosopher. It is uh, frustrating to read in all the ways that you'd expect from reading a French philosopher. Um, It is extremely French, but the basic idea behind it, uh, I love and have loved for 15 years now, which is um, what Rancière is, is interrogating is the idea that the schoolmaster has to be an explicator as opposed to a a person for uh, guiding learning that an explicator who just tells you this is how this is what history was or this is how you learn a language or anything like that is actually a um not a particularly human way of working through a problem of of learning uh that instead that the ignorant schoolmaster in this case is somebody who um lets the who guides the children's learning where they are following their curiosity uh to explore into an into experiment and the ignorant school master is there to help guide them uh guide their learning that but he's not explicating anything now i'm not a schoolmaster but that is effectively most of my job is uh, i keep calling it coaching but most of my job is management and that's effectively what I aspire to be as a manager. I'm not a product expert. I'm not an ex- a engineering expert. I'm not a, and the things I am an expert on aren't things I'm going to get hired for, which is nobody's going to hire me to, for their, you know, teaching people guitar business or, uh, uh, or whatever my other talents are. The biochemistry. <laughs> definitely nobody's hiring me for that um and so what uh what i really view my my role is as a manager is to be able to help create the space where they are uh exploring and experimenting and yeah failing and sometimes not failing and sometimes the failure looks like a failure and is actually a success and sometimes vice versa, but really creating the environment and giving them the help to actually guide that themselves. I'm not interested in trying to force them down a specific path that I quote unquote know is right. And I think uh, part of your journey and part of the journey I've seen a lot of people have is very similar of, oh, if I just help them learn as opposed to help them get it right, I will get so much more out of it as their manager they will get so much more out of it uh as uh employees of the company and uh frankly if you do it well enough and long enough all the people around them get the benefits of it in both their work life and their private life a a you know i i have some issues with uh the uh oh, what's it called the carol Dweck. um uh learning mindset um growth mindset i have oh, some issues okay. 
Yeah, I have some issues with growth mindset um, science, but the general idea of uh, if you put somebody in the right environment and help them learn uh, correctly, or not correctly, if you help them learn well, then you are going to get uh, somebody who is capable of exploring and being productive in areas that you can't even predict and provide value that you can't even um, you can't even understand sometimes that uh, I think that's the most important part of um, management um, and and I like it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> kudos for uh, the word explicator. Um, I would expect <laughs> no less. Uh, and I also appreciate the French reference, though my name is French. It's actually French Canadian. I almost want to add a, a section to this podcast to like force someone to pull weird books off their shelf. Because I have <laughs> tools of critical thinking, which is I haven't read it in a long time, but meta thoughts for psychology, like how I picked this book up is beyond me. But I have, in fact, read it. Um, and I do think I'm a pretty decent critical thinker. Uh, and then another one, Living the Martial Way, which mm -hmm. is a book on martial arts uh, and it's really an incredible book speaking about uh, the journey, not the destination um, amongst other things. Um, but it's, it's funny, the school analogy. Uh, I want to delve into that because yeah. uh, I think it's really interesting. When I was in school, I used to hate rote memorization. I, oh. I detested it. I found it to be the lowest form of, of education. I didn't understand why we didn't use a more Socratic method to teach people how to think, how to reason. I, and, and as I got older, I realized, well, that's really tough to measure. Like you can't improve what you can't measure, except for that's not really true. It's just really hard. It's not necessarily scalable to do so. There's a whole lot of trust that has to go into the people that are actually measuring it because it's not objective, it's subjective. And I have a dear friend who actually was so passionate about this concept that he started a school. It's an Acton Academy. And I don't know a lot about the Acton story, but I do know that they talk about the hero's journey and that everyone has this journey to go through and finding different ways to get people to process information, right? And to design their own experiments uh, is really, I think, you know, you, you describe the growth mindset and you may have some issues with it. But generally speaking, if if you get folks to, you know, one of the ways I, I anchor it to the methodologies that I leverage now, challenge all your givens and your assumptions, don't ever just walk in and assume that your givens and assumptions are correct. In so much as you are capable, apply a new lens to all of those and pressure test them. And sometimes the best way to pressure test them is through collaboration with others. Have yeah. them pressure test them, right? And only then do you move forward with the experiment that says, okay, well, for the sake of argument, here are the givens and assumptions we're going to move forward with. And then you start to go through and iterate and come up with, with what you think the next best action is. Uh, because... You know, forward motion is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it makes uh, makes a lot of sense to me in that. Um, well, here's the thing. One of the one of the best ways to check your assumptions, I find, is uh, it's a principle we use of talentism called start with me which is when you're coming into a meeting, you're coming into a discussion and you're uh, and you want to be able to, whether it's figure out the correct path forward, give someone feedback, whatever it is, you start with what are you bringing into, what are you bringing into uh, the discussion? Um, and by what, what I mean by that is, say I'll do a start with me of, um, okay, what I'm bringing in this discussion is uh, like, I didn't get enough sleep. I'm currently feeling anxious that I don't have uh, this particular thing uh, well prepared. Uh, hey, somebody else in the meeting, I'm. Can I ask for your help here uh, to uh, to keep me on track? If because I didn't sleep enough, I start to wander off into a different area of uh, of the agenda, or something like hey, I got your message um, and, uh, and I just want to say that I was uh, pretty deeply upset by it. Now, I know that a lot of that is me. I know that a lot of that is me because uh, 
you know, I have a big autonomy trigger. I don't like it when people tell me what to do. Uh, I don't know um, uh, that uh, I associate this one thing you said with this other experience that I've had multiple times. I don't truly know if that's what you're doing here because uh, you're a different person than the person who used to do this to me, but I pattern matched it as a human. And so it, it kind of turned me upside down. And so I was pretty upset by, by it, but I know I'm missing things. So can we, uh, can we start out by talking about like, what am I missing? Um, what was, what was behind the message you sent things? It's, it's basically starting with yourself as a human. Here's what I'm bringing into this as a human. Here's what I know about myself in relationship to the context that we are in. And, uh, and here's what I need help with as a result of that, as a way to work through then, okay, I was missing this about the product we're talking about or about the go forward path. I was missing this about, um, you know, how somebody else's talents could play into the plan. I, whatever it is that I'm missing by starting from that lens you uh, are starting from a place of, I believe, humility, and you're allowing people to uh, operate in a um, interdependent way, more than if you were just starting from a sort of rationalist, here's the plan, here's where we're, how we're going to go run through it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I use the word vulnerability a lot as of late, um, maybe because that's one of my more recent sort of lightning rod moments in the last year and a half was discovering the power of vulnerability, mm -hmm. both from a introspective way. Uh, so the, the willingness to demonstrate vulnerability, uh, allowed me to become better at a bunch of things. Um, most notably, uh, at connecting with other humans, uh, most, most often the ones I work with, mm -hmm. um, but it also was a, a nitrous oxide of sorts to building a foundation for trust because only when you expose yourself as fallible uh, and human can people be fallible and human with you, especially if there's a superior inferior model. I hate the hierarchical nature of most business. I don't like the tops, mids, bottoms uh, terminology, but I get it. There's usually some form of hierarchy. And whether there is one or not, there's always a perceived hierarchy in most rooms, right? Mm -hmm. um, so being able to make sure that people well, understand. Literally always. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because people will create one in the absence thereof, right? right? They will they will bring their bias or they will create one just to make sure they understand because we have to create a construct within which we can operate. And generally speaking, a room full of peers is really, really weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there, There's usually, and, and my, I have a dear friend, Travis, who came up with, I don't know if I ever shared this with you. Um, he called it the, the three stooges, uh, psychology of work. And it was actually, it transcended work, right? In, in any group of people, you're going to have a Larry, a Mo and a Curly, right? There's mm -hmm. only ever going to be one Mo in a group. Mo's are the leaders. They always assert themselves as leaders. They cannot be usurped as leaders. They just have something that makes them a leader. Mm -hmm. Curly's are fine because they're going to follow Mo's and they're going to participate and do their things. They're a little bit crazy sometimes, but they get shit done. Larry's are always the challenge because Larry's really, really want to be a Mo. And in the absence of a Mo, they will, uh, they will take that role and Curly's will follow a Larry. But when a Mo comes into the equation, they no longer follow the Larry. And that causes all sorts of, you know, catastrophe in the, in the healthy operation. I'm sure there's a real scientific theory behind this. That's better than the three stooges because we also tried to work in Shemp, but I didn't remember what yeah. Shemp enough as a character. But that that concept of being able to, uh, yeah, we, we take things very seriously. Yeah, in my I, 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 I really uh, also appreciate using um, an analogy that will really sing to the younger generation, the next generation of founders. Hey, Do listen, you? if the younger generation can't use the damn internet, then they don't deserve to be leaders. I, I am so sick and tired of people. Oh, why don't you use something I can relate to? I don't know. Dragon Ball Z? Like, no, I'm not going to do that. And by the way, rap music today sucks, and no one cares whether Drake or Kendrick is better. Real rap beefs were back in the day in the 90s. So, yes, I'm an old guy now. Yeah, also Kendrick's better. Um, Lyrically, of course. I mean, Degrassi, really? <laughs> um. Well, yeah, I mean, I would have gone with uh, Groucho and Harpo, but um, I understand. Yeah, that would have been far more applicable, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. So this this is why people can't take me seriously sometimes, probably. But the the, the I think where we started was the ability to. You were talking about start with me, which was the the, the mentality from talentism, right? And so, um, I think one of the powerful lessons that I've learned through that, and I don't remember it ever being articulated that way that clearly. Like you don't, when you have a coaching session with Trevor, and I assume any of the coaches in talentism's group, it's not like you show up and it's like the teacher gets up to the podium and and says, "Okay, and today we're going to talk about start with me." There's very much some what I used to call, I think, executive couch time right? You bring the set of problems that you're dealing with. And and Trevor would do exactly what he talked about earlier in this podcast, which you'd listen. He's a very good listener, right? And sometimes you need that. And it's not like you need someone to say, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, folks just like you. By the way, that's another old reference to Saturday Night Live when it was still funny, Jack Handy. But um, <laughs> the uh, the thing was, by, by, by listening and truly hearing uh, what was said, Trevor provided that mirror that he talked about. And so you could take that information and in a safe space, right? Another overused phrase, process it and realize, well, maybe I was an asshole. Maybe, maybe the problem was, and this was one of the big things you helped me overcome. One of my blind spots was under periods of extreme stress. And that would be exacerbated by any kind of fatigue that would happen, which quite often uh, in, in the high paced world in which we often live, that was a real thing. Uh, I would, I would get into what we, I think we all end up calling it hyper processing, mm. right? All of the good things about encouraging other folks to participate and working through the experiments and doing all those things, those take time. It is incredibly good time to spend. And that was one of the things that you guys taught me was that time has an immense ROI uh, in your team because it not only leads to better decisions, better results, better actions, but it leads to a, a more powerful and empowered team who will then go do that throughout your organization. It spreads like a really positive virus. But under under pressure, under constraint, you always look for shortcuts. And when mm-hmm. I would get into that hyper-processing mode is when I would absolutely screw things up. And I couldn't see it. I would just look at it as you know when someone was trying to explain to me how they were thinking about a problem, I'm sitting there tapping my watch. Like, could you please get to the end? Cause I know where you're going to get and I don't have time to wait for you. So I'm going to tell you how you're going to tell me this is going to end. And I'm going to tell you a better next step because I need to move on to the next fire because right now there's fires burning everywhere. Mm-hmm. By the way, I was almost always wrong. Right. And by the way, most of us are always wrong. When we say that we need to take the time to review those perspectives because yeah, I mean, hell uh, a direction is a direction. But realizing that and then being willing to go to my team and say, folks, listen, I get it. I'm in one of those modes. I need to pull myself out of this. I need you guys to iterate on it because I will be short. I will be rude. And none of these things are acceptable or appropriate or any of those things, but they are human. And and you can't, like, uh, you guys, you gave me permission to, to evaluate this. And I don't mean you specifically, like Trevor, back to the Irish Catholic thing. You're not my, my, my one senior or priest or whatever. Right. But you gave me intellectual permission to, to acknowledge that weakness, that, that weak spot, that blind spot. And it was no longer blind. I could see it. And when I saw it, I could tell my team, I informed them of it. Hey, this is a thing about me and I'm trying to get better at it. But when I'm in this problem, I, I I'm, here's how I'm going to communicate it. And I need you guys to help out the best you can. And we became better for it. I mean, absolutely better for it. Yeah. And also, if you're able to do that, here's the thing. Here, and here's what I think is so challenging. One of the things that's so challenging about being a human is I could give you a a rule, a, a heuristic about, you know, always listen. Don't hyper process. Always listen first. Don't don't just try to cut through, um, you know, uh, when other people have things to say. And generally, that's true. But it's not always true. Sometimes there is actually something. Sometimes you're in triage. Sometimes you need to stop the yep. bleeding. And if you need to stop the bleeding, having a kumbaya conversation uh, isn't actually the best uh, course of action. What Start With Me provides is um, context for why those behaviors are happening. If the behavior is happening because 
you just have an autonomy trigger and you're being impatient and you got other things that you'd rather be doing and you're kind of annoyed with this person, then yeah, you're going to create bad results. Um, and, but if the behavior is happening because there's a critical thing uh, that is wrong with the business, which happens, as you know, uh, if there's a critical thing that's wrong with the business and we can't sit here and sense make around it, I have to go drive an outcome and I'll help you make sense of like what I'm doing later, but that's what I'm doing. I'm doing this because I'm orienting to the goal. I'm orienting to what the business needs, not to my own personal preference. That That is a much less bewildering experience for people than just seeing their, their leader, the person who is psychologically uh, above them in the hierarchy, dismiss them. Um, you used a word here, orienting or a phrase, orienting towards the goal. Mm -hmm. And I think I've heard you say it before, but I haven't added it to my own uh, communication stack. I used to really focus on we're only ever attacking a problem. We're never attacking a person. Right. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I decoupled the challenge that we're facing, even if it you know, was someone's idea. We're not attacking Joe's idea, right? Or Jane's idea, or Jane or Joe. We're attacking the idea that they came up with. It doesn't make them a bad person. We have to look at that idea or the problem that may be manifested from that idea. And that is easy to do when you have a team that has trust amongst each other. They realize that you're never attacking them personally. Mm -hmm. I used to joke around all the time uh, when I would when I would make a you know I tend to be a real a little bit lax with my language at times, and and I would reference something being stupid or whatever right or bad, and you know I do want to get into BSL narratives at some point because that was another powerful point you guys brought across in, in my coaching, but when I did broadcast I would always say well I'm sure this person's a nice person he probably doesn't kick puppies uh, he probably loves his kids right but this is a terrible idea. And and you and I would almost use that extreme difference mm -hmm. to try and prove the point. And it takes a long time to get people to realize when their their idea is attacked or a problem they're working on is brought up as not going well, to not personify that or to take that on as an attack on their persona. Uh, and the only thing I've seen that makes that better is either intense attention to the communication or being far enough down the road where the people trust the team well enough that they just know that that's true. Yeah. So my experience around this is, so uh, I've been a part of training, not quite all of our coaches anymore, but a lot of our coaches. Um, and one of the comments that I get, because we'll show practice sessions and things, uh, or sessions that we've gotten permission to show um, and some of which I'm leading or Jeff is leading. And we'll get these comments about, wow, I can't believe you said this thing to them. And it will be like, oh yeah, what you're saying, uh, we'll tell the client, what you're saying doesn't make sense. Like, I don't, like you said this, you said this, it like you seem to be missing it. And you seem to be missing it because like, you just want to be right. And you're going to do anything you can to make sure that the person that who reports to you knows you're right. And it doesn't actually even matter to you whether you're right. Um, and the coaches were trained, like, oh, that, that seemed really like harsh when you said that to them. Um, and what we say is, I mean, it's not going to be the first thing I say to them when I meet them. If <laughs> you got to build the trust to do that. And it, what it is, is, um, and then we'll have other coaches like, okay, I'll build a trust. So I'll just, I'll, and it'll be, I'll be nice to them for a couple sessions. And then, and then I'll start to turn up. Not being <laughs> nice. Like, no, 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 it's not being nice. It's, you need to convince the person on the other end, whether it's a client, whether it's somebody who reports to you, a peer, whatever, that you are on their team, that you are there yeah. for them. If they believe in their heart of hearts that you are there for them, you can say a lot of shit to them that nobody else can. Yeah. And if they don't believe that, then you got to figure out a way to make them to believe that. And that might actually start with you questioning your for yourself whether you actually are there for them, whether you actually are on their team. Because 
human beings are complicated and sometimes we tell ourselves that yeah our actions are virtuous and they are not they are monkey brain like everything else we do and uh and so the process of starting with yourself of understanding yourself of being able to assert things uh in a way that is very direct but coming from a place of i am on your team i am trying to get us an outcome we both want or trying to make you better or trying to understand what i'm missing is it's yeah as i said derisively kumbaya earlier but it, it's not it's not that it's you need to show that you are there for them you need to show it you need to to um actually be there to go to bat for them uh when it makes sense you need to be there to be like hey i see you having this level of self self-doubt it doesn't make sense to me it doesn't make sense to me that you would think you wouldn't you wouldn't be capable of doing this thing or you'd have these doubts you need to show that hey the reason i'm giving you this feedback is because i think you're capable of so much more and i want to see you do that i want to see you be that person and i will do what i can to help you be that person and again if they believe it you you've got a lot of you got a lot of room to learn together yeah I, I, like so many other things it comes down to the connect, connection between you uh and, and in the coaching it's a one-to-one -one usually though i imagine you do group coaching as well i imagine anytime you add variables like one to many uh the the complexity goes up i'll say exponentially because everyone says that when they mean greater than one to one it's not really exponentially but i digress um that's like earlier you said that you learned by osmosis and i of course was like eh, it's more like diffusion because it's not really water but i get it um we all say learning through osmosis uh <laughs> it's the idiot uh, I don't, it is. I don't have to. I don't have to break down every idiom. I'll save that for when people say chomping at the bit instead of champing at the bit. Instead of champing. <laughs> God. So I don't know. Maybe no one else enjoys that kind of discussion as much as we do, but that's okay. So uh, we touched <laughs> on BSL or bad, stupid, lazy narratives. This was another area of, uh, I would say, weakness in my game when I came to the talentism uh, group. Um, tell people a little bit about bsl narratives and how you see them manifest in your clients and and what people can look out for uh because I, it was a it was another powerful one and it's one that people can kind of just they can get it right it's not one that takes six sessions to to really understand oh my god this is the epiphany moment this one as soon as you'll explain it to people i assure you people on this podcast be like ah shit i totally get what he's saying yeah so uh, uh as is customary for me i'll give too long of a lead up and start with perfect uh we are apes we are apes who like every other animal species on this planet uh evolved to deal with dangers which are present to us in the moment um we are the only animal which is capable of thinking into the deep future but we're not well evolved for thinking in the deep future all of all of the um you know, hormonal machinery is still basically uh, evolved for uh, current state. And so we wander around having expectations around uh, the way uh, around everything, but around how people are going to act around us. And then those expectations are not going to be met in some way. Inevitably, somebody is going to do something that confuses you, does not meet your expectation. And when that happens, what we are literally wired to do is make a quick connection to something else synthesize like oh they must have done that because they had uh poor intent bad character they had um uh bad uh motivation or lack of motivation they were lazy um or they lacked the intelligence to be able to do it they were stupid bad stupid or lazy and we all we all have it we all diagnose people quickly um when they don't perform to our expectation uh oh that person's bad that person's stupid that person's lazy uh in addition to doing that to other people we do it to ourselves all the time oh man i didn't i screwed that up because i'm such an idiot i'm or like ah oh, why why am i so lazy i should have gotten off the couch and done that or um or i'm just a piece of shit or whatever it is like 
everyone has these particular um, thoughts go through their head. Everyone. And and here and they aren't necessarily um, wrong, but they're fairly useless. Um, that is, it's a snap judgment that uh, turns off learning. It it says, oh, that person did that because they're a shitty person instead of, oh, why did that person do that? What were the conditions in the environment? What did I do? What did other people do? Is that behavior going to happen again? Um, do I understand uh, what the intent behind that behavior? It turns off all that. Just call them a bad person. You're not thinking. It's like, oh, that person's an idiot. Um, well, okay, they may have missed something. Why did they miss something? Is it because they lack the experience or is it because they truly lack the ability to understand it? What are the things they do understand? How can you better place them into an a environment, a context, a project uh, to actually take advantage of the things that they're good at? Placing these sorts of uh, value judgments on person. Once you've decided somebody is stupid and you don't actually reinterrogate your own opinion about that, you're never going to be able to discover uh, what makes that person unique. They're just going to be an idiot. Once you decide that they're bad, once you decide they're lazy, they, you just will not be in a position to get to clarity about uh, what that person actually will be good at, what they'll actually deliver value against, whether you, in fact, are uh, part of the cause uh, that is bringing out that behavior, that is, you're missing what you're doing, that is, you would call uh, bad, super lazy to the environment. You're just missing so many things. And that the basic idea of bad, stupid, lazy is that when you go to those uh, diagnoses, you stop learning. And that's bad. So uh, a billion years ago when I was at Microsoft, uh, McConnell wrote a ton of books about how to produce software. And Stephen McConnell, I think, is his name. And one of the things he talked about was when you're having conversations about building product, uh, you know, you got to be careful. to You don't want to flip the bozo bit on someone, which is essentially the stupid uh, portion of the bad, stupid, or lazy. Um, because once you do, like you said, I mean, you said it powerfully. When you do this, you stop learning. In many ways, the attribution of someone being bad or someone being stupid or someone being lazy might make you feel better viscerally, right? But it does nothing to advance the ball, right? You, you still have to solve whatever problem is being manifested the, the trigger that made someone bring this up or address it in a way that was less than ideal or whatever the case may be, it, it's color at best and it's color that, that, that makes you less likely to deduce or, or get to the real problem. Um, it's funny, I threw Hanlon's razor up there, right, which uh, mm. I happen to love, never attribute to malice that, which can be adequately just explained by stupidity. I think, it's, I think there'd be a modification. There may be one. It may be Frankie's uh, razor. Um, which is not stupidity, but ignorance. Ignorance is not inherently bad. Ignorance is the, the position we most likely start with. We are ignorant to details that will help us become informed and educated. Uh, ignorance repeated becomes stupidity, and, and then that really does become an issue, right? But that's a separate and distinct issue. Um, I remember a situation uh, with our private equity firm, and I went through this with you in our coaching sessions, when they were directing us in a certain path that made no sense to me as the as the person who was responsible for leading the company. Uh, there was a lack of, uh, in this particular case, it was a lack of investment during a, a particularly tr trying time. And I thought, well, they're the investing group. They're the money people. They should, here's the thing. You guys bring the money. We bring all the other stuff. So when I come to you and I say, hey, I need money, your answer should oftentimes be yes, because you trusted us to tell you that. I didn't ask for money all the time. The problem was I never tried to evaluate the business from their perspective. I never mm -hmm. looked at why they were directing us in this particular direction. I was only interested in my perspective. And so while I would gnash my teeth about their uh, responses, it was from a position of my own ignorance and my own unwillingness to look at their perspective. And that, that lesson, like I said, I don't know how long it took me to learn it. And I think that we always relearn because we're going to fall into these behaviors. As you mentioned, we are human animals. Uh, my brother actually says that the deacon says, you know, we're human animals. Um, mm -hmm. 
But uh, when you can get through that emotive response, it doesn't mean become a Vulcan. I don't know if a Vulcan is a dated uh, reference as well. I think Star Trek is still being made, so that's useful. And William Shatner at 700 years is still kicking ass. But um, if you can get through the emotive response and and try and figure out uh, a logical path why this is being done, it's just far better. Um so I'm, I'm glad we touched on this one because it was another one of those really powerful lessons. And I think it's one of the cornerstones of some of the, the IP that represents talentism. And with, with that being said, I really want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about what talentism is doing, right? I don't have a huge following, but I of course hope this following will get larger mm -hmm. as it spreads out in, in the weird network of things. Um, you know, I know that you guys have a, a ton of stuff going into your intellectual property and, and you also have the concept of not just individual executive coaching, but there are times where you've coached entire executive teams and and you're using uh, strategic insights, organizational insights to create, I believe the phrase you guys are, are advancing is clarity companies because you mm -hmm. seek clarity for individuals, but the concept of becoming having a clarity company, a company that is founded on those sort of principles is really, really att attractive. Uh, can you describe a little bit about what you're doing to get to that end? Yeah, absolutely. So uh to start with the the purpose of talentism the purpose of talentism is to systematically unleash human potential and those words are deliberately chosen systematically it's very important to the idea of human potential to us um and so when talentism started it was a consulting company um and we sort of gradually found our way into coaching but even then i wouldn't say at the end of the day, while I am a coach, while I spend a lot of time coaching, the thing I care about isn't coaching itself. The thing I care about actually is management. So when you make the analogy, as you did earlier, to um, you know people on the football field uh, and they need a coach, yeah, that coach is really their manager. That coach is really the one who's responsible for their results, who is responsible for helping them get better, um, who owns the goal of winning the game. A uh, What we want is to create companies which uh, win in the market by finding the value in uh, human beings that other companies can't find. That is, they win by uh, finding the potential of their people. Uh, the winning is important. It's, it's not just feeling better and everyone's happy. It has to lead to uh, business results. And we think the thing that holds companies back from being able to unleash the potential of their people, or a prime thing that holds companies back, is management, bad management. And the... Uh, though I could riff on it for a while, I'll try to, I'll try to do it quickly. The origins of why most companies have bad management is entirely structural. It um, uh, goes back to Frederick Winslow Taylor and the idea of designing for business and uh, translating the, the meatpacking plant processes into processes that fit almost any business and you design for the business first, you create the role and you shove a person into that box and uh, and then you manage them to make them uh, to make it work. And if they don't work, then you get rid of them, you replace it with someone else. Um, and uh, and then there's also the Peter principle thing of, uh, well, how did you become a manager? Well, I did a completely different job really well. So they made me do this. Um, and well, why did you take that? Well, because they paid me more and it's what I need to do to to progress in my career. Like if you assume management is not just a talent you can sort of read a book and get good at, or not just a skill you can read a book and get good at, but an actual talent, a part of who you are and your personality, the way that we uh, that we determine who's a manager, promote uh, managers and support managers makes no sense. And so, my general experience with most people, vast majority of people, is they have never experienced what I would call good management. Um, 
And good management, as I would define it, is uh, being able to accomplish goals through the work of others by identifying um, what is uh, essentially unique, what is essentially distinctive about that person, and how can I put them in a place to win uh, to be able to accomplish our goals. And so what Talentism is trying to do in creating clarity companies is we, uh, our services, coaching, the various forms of our coaching, the, um, the uh, 360s, the different trainings are all intended to be a, a building towards an outsourced system of management. So you have a company, you are really good at um, looking into the future of uh, medical services and creating novel and useful medical services. Great. That's what you are good at. You then start working with us slowly at first, but the idea is if we prove our value, and we always have to prove it. We always have to show that we're actually good at it. But if we prove our value through the coaching, through everything else, we are coming in more and more as an outsourced uh, clarity management for you and for your company. We are there owning the goal with you. We are there driving that goal. And we are there helping you with the design of your business to understand what your people are like, how, um, what really... Uh, their talents are, what their distinctions are, and how to create designs that put them in a position to win, and then how to identify gaps that don't exist. In order to get there, in order to have those pictures, you need to do all the things we've talked about today. You need to help people start with themselves. You need to help people identify BSL narratives. You need to help them identify what they're missing about themselves, about others, et cetera, because all those narratives will, will make the picture of what people are actually like very, very murky. But if you can get there and help clear that picture up, and then you can help them actually create better designs and better drive towards goals through individual work, through group work, through software, through training, um, through content, uh, then you uh, then you're putting them in a position to win because they are using their people better than anyone else. Interesting. So when you talk about the foundations of our current models, uh, the, the industrial complex, you know, writ large uh, and, and superimposed on top of the knowledge worker uh, ecosystem that we live in now, not to say there isn't a tremendous amount of industrial stuff that goes on. And that model may be just totally great for them. Who knows? Right. Yeah. Um, but back to where we sort of opened this conversation Companies that are more successful are more successful because they're more successful at making their empowering their people to do great things scope to the world in which they live. Right. So if I'm a medical services company, right, I've got a bunch of folks who ostensibly have background in their skills, talents, the more of that potential I can unleash through better management, as you've defined it, not as sort of colloquially used in the in the uh, larger sphere. Right. Yeah. The more empowered those folks can be, the better everything's going to be. Like, I mean, I think Richard Branson is the one who's notorious about this. It's not about his customers. It's about his people. If you mm -hmm. take care of your people, they'll take care of the customers. They'll do that on their own. That is a secondary benefit to taking care of your people and empowering your people. Um, because yeah. when you think about Her acquisition. Oh, yeah. Fair. Yeah. Fair. So when you, when you think about cost turnover and churn and dissatisfaction and quiet quitting and all of the other things that exist, right? Raw efficacy uh, is so negatively impacted by people that are dissatisfied, disgruntled, uh, poorly leveraged, right? Uh, it's, it's amazing. So it's, it's a, it's a hell of a task to go after. And uh, you know, I can claim the bias of having firsthand coaching experience with you guys. I think it's a, it's something you guys are uniquely well suited to to attack so hopefully you guys are having some success i think you are by judging from the outside looking in it seems like things are going well you guys have a fantastic podcast the clarifier um uh that i actually subscribe to and listen to quite regularly you guys have great guests on there and i think you guys are doing all this by building mindshare 
uh, and, and continuing to advance your intellectual property, which is the, the methodologies that you employ, but it's not like it's a Coke secret recipe, yeah. right? It's a, it's a set of primitives that you guys leverage. And then the way you describe it, it almost sounds like you become an adjunct to a large enough company's HR system, right? And I don't mean that in, a, in any sort of denigration, right? Because I think HR is really, really important. That's working on your human capital, right? How do you take care of your people? Well, HR is supposed to do that. It's not just supposed to take care of the company. There is a necessary duality that HR is supposed to take care of your people as yeah. well as represent the company. And by bringing in objective tool sets and, and data and information and experiments, it seems like you can do a much better job of that. Yeah, and, and certainly there are many uh, places that we partner with HR and, um, and do so, I think, successfully. Um, the, for what my brain uh, does how my brain works. The um, so my title is is chief clarity officer, which I know means nothing to anyone. Um, Ironically, it's not very clear. <laughs> um, and and that's fine. I'm I'm willing to fight a long battle here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but the idea behind the chief clarity officer is that. Um, if management is the thing that's standing in the way of enterprise potential and individual potential, then, um, well, the area of the company that's that's traditionally focused on management or the, the role that's traditionally focused on management is the chief operating officer, COO. Um, and the, the COO, um concentrating on functional management that is how does a function actually work how what are the processes by which something is delivered the sort of nuts and bolts of it still makes a ton of sense to me but it is a very very rare individual who's really good at that and really good at the people management side rare enough right. that i would that i would say i've never seen anyone i've seen a few individuals do one or the other but never at the same time Trying to hold both of those in your head at the same time, I, I, my suspicion is it's practically impossible um, with with excellence. Um, and so the idea behind the chief clarity officer is that it's like a, a division off of the chief operating officer responsible for the people management of the company, uh, in the same way that the chief operating officer is responsible for the functional management of the company. Now, I, I know that um, that has uh, relationships with uh, the way chief people, uh, chief people officers are sometimes conceptualized, uh, CHROs, et cetera. I think they're different in a way that um, that uh, it's probably a hill I'm going to die on at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the practical reality of it is um, that... Uh, I, as a chief clarity officer, I do have a lot of, um, <laughs> I guess I'll use the word, even though I'm deeply uncomfortable with it, like authority over things in a way that half the time I go into a company and the HR department, the people ops, like they're playing catch up to, to what all the like real executives are doing. I mean, like the COO and the, the CEO, it's like how they, it's like, you know, we run the business, like take care of the people stuff. And, and not every, but most uh, HR people, I uh, experience something that I've talked to experience something like that or agreed by it. I under, totally understand why they are. Um, but as, uh, as an actual functioning area of the business, driving specific company goals, not like people goals, but company goals. I am every day trying to drive sales goals through my work with the sales department, trying to drive uh, product goals through my work with the product department, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think is a, uh, a novelty uh, at the very least in how we're trying to approach the question of uh, excellent management and how to use, how to use excellent management to um to yeah help companies win 
it's interesting the amount of time and thought that's obviously gone into the titles. Um, yeah, I worked with a guy who was hilarious. I still good friends with him. Happy birthday, as a matter of fact, to my friend Tom. Today's his birthday. Happy um, birthday, Tom. I remember uh, when I came onto the team, we were talking about business cards or something and talking about titles because that's usually what leads to the discussion of titles if you weren't brought in under a certain auspices, right? And he's like, I don't give a shit what you put on your business card. He's like, write whatever you want on your business card. Whatever helps you do better for our clients. Right? If you need to be the president of the company this week, be the president of the company. He's like, I'm not telling you to be disingenuous. I'm telling you that if you derive power from your title, then cool. Uh, if your client will transfer authority to you because of your title, cool. What we really want to do is know what we're there for. What good are we trying to bring to our clients and how can we best effectuate that? So I think that what the, the discussion you just led was about empowering whatever group is responsible, has charter to help the people as a resource in your organization and how that group interrelates with the perceived leadership of the enterprise, right? There was a bifurcation between the CEO, CEO, and everybody else. And you're not wrong. Quite often, HR is shoved under like we had it under the CFO. But under the CFO? No, the CFO is a member of the executive team. In our case, Joe had just as much authority as anyone else. And, you know, we had, we were a multinational company. So we had a US HR, we had an India HR, and we had, well, we didn't, we had global HR, non US HR, I guess is what we would call it. But making sure that they understand that they have an important seat at the table, arguably the most important seat at the table. Now, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean they get anything that they want. It doesn't mean that they can be the dictator, right? It means that you have to make sure that we start with the discussion about how this impacts our people. And even the most optimistic, doe-eyed leaders, uh, you know, idealists, if you will, uh, need to be reminded of that. Uh, I, I know that I've done a, an absolute mm -hmm. shit job of it over my career at times. Uh, it's like this sine wave of, of, you know, moments of excellence and moments of despair. Um, but, uh, yeah. but having that as something to pay attention to is really important. And codifying that in your organizational chart, I think, is really important. Yeah. And by the way, the, uh, the vacillation between uh, moments of excellence and moments of despair is, I think, how it works. As yeah. in, I, I, don't think that, I don't think that's a bug. I think that's a feature. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that's a topic for the day. I've already kept you here for an hour and a half, as as my podcasts are wont to do. They go on a bit long, like I do. Um, so maybe a, a topic for another day is is the pursuit of chopping off the bottom uh, while still maintaining the top of that curve. I don't know that it's possible. I know that it's a goal that I've certainly tried. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm afraid of the trough, because sometimes you've got to see what's at the bottom in order to bounce even further up. Um, but it's, it's interesting yeah. that it's intellectually something that we spend time talking about. Yeah, I would, I would argue that, um, the real thing to chase isn't to reduce the, uh, magnitude of the bottom. It's to increase the frequency. That is, you want the loops to go faster. You want to be, you want to go through those dips okay. fast and you want to go, but don't try well you can try to do whatever you want you can live your life however you want i'm not, I'm not <laughs> well gonna, thank you i appreciate that <laughs> i'm not going to say anything about that but <laughs> if the thing if the thing that you want is um to live a life exploring your own potential um through learning then uh you can't avoid um the moments that feel really bad yeah. Yeah. You can't get out of the sucking parts, right? It's funny. I, I literally sucks. just, I told a friend of mine this the other day, when I turned 40, which was a thousand years ago, I decided I was going to try and stop sucking at golf. I, I have historically been good at sports because I was the fat kid. So I had to get good. So I didn't get picked last. It was just sort of a cycle of my young adulthood, right? That's, Derek, that's how I, I grew up. That. Right. So, well, the other people don't, you, you, we spent years together. They haven't spent years <laughs> with me, but with golf. As, as the other fat kid, I also... <laughs> Oh, that you! It was actually got, a personal experience. I got I got really good at rebounding. Yeah, yeah. Listen, you, if, if I'm the captain, I'm always picked first. So, <laughs> but but I didn't use that same model with golf. I just figured, well, I I'm kind of athletic. I'll be good at it. And then I just continued to suck the way most people do. And it, the numbers of people who break a hundred legitimately are staggeringly small. And so I went and took a week long lesson. I was going to dedicate myself to this intense week long lesson, and that was going to make it better because because that's how it works. 
And I get in there and I'm, I'm taking my swings and, and the instructor is like, well, I'd like you to do this and adjust this and change your stance like this. And I take a couple swings and I remember looking at him going, this feels really, really, I was really being a shitty, shitty student, right? This feels terrible. This feels weird. This feels, And fortunately, this coach is at Graves Golf Institute. I really like those guys a lot. Um, Sidetrack, that's a Mo Norman swing, a single plane swing for anyone tracking this at home. He goes, he goes, your current swing has you shooting 110s and 120s. It sucks. So I would assert anything that I give you that feels alien, weird, or different, you should absolutely <laughs> adore. And I was like, wow, that was really harsh. But 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 I kind of love you for saying it that way. Thank you, sir. May I have another? So yeah, I guess you're absolutely right. You've got to be willing to just absolutely suck at something because if you just keep doing it the same way, you're never gonna you're never gonna change. Yeah. So and then a uh, little follow-up story from that. Uh, my brother Jeff, CEO of Talentism, has his own story about that. He wanted to get good at golf. He had an instructor, same thing, change everything. It's like, yeah, it's going to feel terrible because your swing sucks. And then <laughs> he he got to the point where he was hitting straight down the fairway. It was beautiful. And, and then um, it's like, yeah, what do you think? You're going to go, you should go play around. Like now you can be good at golf. He's like, oh no, what this taught me is I don't care about golf. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Fair. Well, uh, Trevor, I want to thank you for taking the time. I know you're very busy uh, and I appreciate you taking an exceptional amount of time to come on the podcast. I leave the floor open to you to let people know how to get in touch with you, how to get in touch with talentism, anything you want to drop on the podcast for them for follow up. Uh, and then we'll get, get you out of here and get you back to changing the lives of executives. Yeah. Smash like, hit subscribe. Yeah, you got to smash yeah. it. <laughs> Hate uh, that phrase. <laughs> uh yeah, uh, if you would, uh, you should check out our website. There's lots of uh, podcasts, readings, things on our website. If you are interested in hearing more, talentism.com. Um, if uh, you want to drop me a line for any reason, talk talentism things, talk cooking. I'm not very good at golf, so I don't think I can uh, give much advice there. Um, it hasn't stopped any golfer in the history of golf from giving uh, advice on how to golf. Yeah, I have, a, I have a goal problem with golf, which is I really just want to hit it really hard. I don't want to be good at golf. I just want to do that. And unfortunately, those two goals uh, are not well aligned. Um, uh, but uh, Trevor at Talentism.com and, uh, and always, I was going to say, always happy to hear and engage with new people. That's not true. But I'm, I usually force myself to do it. Uh, and it's good for me. <laughs> I don't I think it's sort of uh like you said it's a feature uh not a bug of what you do you're going to have to engage with new people <laughs> otherwise you guys are are dead in the water and that's certainly not what I would describe talentism as so thanks yeah. again best to the whole team over there and uh and we'll get this podcast out and hopefully people enjoy it and uh we'll we'll follow up and, and maybe have a follow on call uh discussion about cooking because I know we share that uh that passion as well I would love that Derek thank you right. take care Trevor all right. Well, I want to thank everyone for tuning into this episode of Plain Spoken. I was very happy to have Trevor with us on this show. Not only do I enjoy Trevor as a human, uh, but I think that he and the team at Talentism have a tremendous amount to offer. In fact, so much so that, uh, that I'm trying to learn even more about it. I, I mentioned in the podcast that I was a resistant recipient of coaching, which was incredibly strange for me, given how much I love coaching in almost every other capacity. But I, I definitely was resistant. I, I think I mentioned I went through quite a few other uh, coaching options uh, before I landed with Talentism. And that's not to say that the other ones wouldn't have been fantastic. I'm sure there are countless great methods and methodologies out there. I just happen to resonate with Trevor. To sum up on the key takeaways of this, uh, this episode with Trevor, you know, he introduced the concept of a chief clarity officer, and that's really part and parcel or the heart of what Talentism speaks about. There are three C's, starting with the confusion that leads sometimes to certainty, which is dangerous but ideally the clarity through the experimenting phase that, that they invoke was important. And, and that concept of having clarity be the focus in HR, whether in a separate title or certainly a discipline within the construct of human resources, being there to help your team, all folks on the team, find clarity is really important. And that's what, what Trevor does, where they really literally eat, well, not literally, literally only in the way people have morph the word literally to mean, but figuratively eat their own dog food by driving clarity within their own organization. 
The next was significance of good management. When you look at what we talked about in this podcast, and if you go out and listen to Jeff Hunter, the founder, his brother, a talentism has got some great podcasts he's been on as a guest. When you think about the opportunity cost there of, of the potential, and human potential is, is the phrase that they use at talentism, that is lost because people are not empowered. And that doesn't mean they're not given opportunities. It doesn't mean that they're not coddled. There's so many pejoratives that have been thrown into this. This means as a manager working with and through your team to drive the best results. This is this is your capacity. And I hate to, to dehumanize it because it's actually the opposite. Of that. We're actually humanizing this. But how do you empower and help your team to be the best they can all individually be so that in aggregate, your organization can be the best that it can be? Because otherwise, you're leaving a tremendous amount of talent, potential, and capability on the table. And, and ultimately, that does start throwing it over into the CFO bucket and, and hits the value of your company. Building trust. Uh, and, and one of the things that we tried to do was decouple the problem from the person. This is something that Trevor and I talked a lot about. It's something I feel really uh, you know, emotionally connected to, probably because of the time I spent at Microsoft when this wasn't really the focus. Uh, at least it wasn't explicitly the focus. It was something you had to sort of infer. And if you didn't infer that, then you didn't get along very well back in the early days of Microsoft. Now, subsequent to that, you know, in the 17,000 years since I left Microsoft, things have gotten a lot more human, which is great. I think that that's progress. But I think that as professionals, we need to realize that we are always attacking problems. And if we're not, if we're really attacking people, we have a serious issue that we've got to address. So building enough trust within your team that they understand that the the ferocity with which you attack the problems are really attacking the problems and not the person will help you not personalize the issue. That'll also reduce the likelihood of falling into what we talked about in the podcast, which are BSL narratives or bad, stupid, lazy narratives, which are almost always driven by bias. Uh, that is something that you, you really have to look out for. It's a blind spot we all have. I certainly have it. Um, and I would encourage you to take that one away uh, from this podcast. You've got to make sure that you avoid snap judgments. It's a great transition. The snap judgments are usually done as a fight or flight response. And, and to be honest, they're just lazy. Now, that is an assessment of my own behavior. I think it, you could find it in yours as well. That's not a bad, stupid, lazy narrative against yourself, though that would be an interesting irony. Take the time to truly understand why you are feeling a certain way. And this, again, is not about being touchy-feely or any of that stuff. Again, there are a lot of folks that really love that side of management and want to get in touch with that. It's not my thing, necessarily. But listening to what your emotive response is to a situation is important to understand whether you are processing all of the information and taking the time to truly analyze it. When you make snap judgments, you're almost always going to put yourself into a bad situation. Take a break. Acknowledge that you're confused. Acknowledge that you are confused by the situation. The, the model that your mind had created is not being matched in reality. And take the time to try and drive clarity through asking questions and engaging experimentation. And that leads us into the last one, which is the importance and the empowerment that is driven by uh, the implementation of clear communication. Understanding where people come from, leveraging in a truly positive sense, the power of different lenses of people on your team is the huge force multiplier for organizations. People, just the count of, of bodies in your organization is not your force multiplier. It's when you can take all of those perspectives and experience and wisdom and at a micro level, apply them to every task in the organization so that at a macro level, the entire organization benefits. So. Those are the takeaways. I really appreciate Trevor coming on the podcast. I look forward to having him on again. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, we both like to cook. I don't know that we'll ever get that worked into the Plain Spoken podcast, but hopefully you guys are enjoying the content here. Um, we'll have another podcast out probably in a couple of weeks. I'll let you know who that's going to be, and we'll continue to try and be active in LinkedIn. That's really the social media that we leverage for work here. But if you're interested in being on the podcast, drop us a note at info at plainsight.net, and uh, we'll see if we can get you in there or on the Contact Us button. Uh, we have had some press releases lately that I think are very exciting about our lean forward methodology, which I'll do a little uh, plain and simple episode on, as well as some exciting things around people joining the team at a partner level uh, that that got us kind of fired up in what we can do 
to help organizations across the country and potentially across, across the globe. So again, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show and found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, 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 what